From New York, this is Democracy Now! I was concerned by the call. What I heard was inappropriate, and I reported my concerns to Mr. Eisenberg. It is improper for the President of the United States to demand a foreign government investigate a U.S. citizen and a political opponent. Unusual, improper, inappropriate, and wrong. That's how witnesses on the third day of impeachment hearings describe President Trump's actions pressuring Ukraine to investigate his political rival, Joe Biden, and his son, Hunter. Even the witnesses requested by Republican lawmakers criticize the president's actions. In hindsight, I now understand that others saw the idea of investigating possible corruption involving the Ukrainian company Burisma as equivalent to investigating former President, Vice President Biden. In retrospect, I should have seen that connection differently, and had I done so, I would have raised my own objections. We'll get the latest on the impeachment hearings, then to Iran, where Amnesty International says security forces have killed over 100 protesters. And we mark Trans Remembrance Day a day that honors the thousands of transgender and gender nonconforming people who've been killed around the world. All that and more coming up. Welcome to Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. Army Lieutenant Colonel Alex Vindman testified in a televised House impeachment hearing over whether President Trump withheld military aid from Ukraine to pressure the Ukrainian president to investigate Trump's political rival Joe Biden and his son. Among Vindman's statements, he said he couldn't believe what he's hearing when he listened to the July 25th phone call between President Trump and Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky. During the call, Trump pressured Zelensky to investigate his political rival Joe Biden and his son, who served on the board of a Ukrainian natural gas company, Burisma. Vindman, who's the director for European affairs at the National Security Council, testified along with Jennifer Williams, a Russia advisor for Vice President Pence. On Tuesday afternoon, House investigators heard the testimonies of Kurt Volker, the former U.S. special envoy to Ukraine, and Tim Morrison, former senior director for European and Russian affairs on the National Security Council. Today, U.S. Ambassador to the European Union Gordon Sondland will testify to lawmakers. He's a wealthy hotel magnate and real estate developer from Oregon. He received his ambassadorship after donating a million dollars to Trump's inauguration. His lack of diplomatic experience led one White House foreign policy adviser to complain Sondland was a national security risk. In Iran, Amnesty International says security forces killed over 100 protesters during ongoing nationwide protests sparked by a sudden hike in fuel prices last week. The report also warns the death count may be much higher, with some suggesting as many 200 have been killed. On Thursday, Iran announced a rise in the cost of gas, ranging from 50 to 300 percent. On Sunday, soon after the protests broke out, Iran imposed an almost complete internet blackout. We'll have more on the Iranian protests later in the broadcast. In Bolivia, police and military forces killed at least five pro-Morales protesters and injured dozens more Tuesday in at least the second massacre against Evo Morales' supporters since the longtime Bolivian president was ousted in what he calls a military coup. Tuesday's massacre occurred in El Alto, near the capital of La Paz, where protesters had been blocking a major fuel plant for days. Police and military forces deployed helicopters and armored vehicles to the protest site. Witnesses say a military unit then opened fire on protesters, killing at least five young men. This is one of the victim's relatives. The one that were in the back took him and dragged him inside. What are they going to do with him now? Are they going to disappear him? Now they are saying there are no people dead. There are people dead. The brothers are here. There are people dead. The bullet went through him, and the doctors are saying he's going to die properly. And the press is not saying anything. They say there are no clashes. Tuesday's killings follow Friday's massacre near Cochabamba, 
where security first forces killed at least nine Morales supporters. This all comes as Germany has secured access to Bolivia's vast reservoir of lithium, a key raw material used to produce cell phone and electric car batteries. Shortly before his ouster, the Bolivian president Evo Morales said he planned to cancel the agreement with Germany, but the right-wing government of self-declared president Janine Añez now says the mining deal will move forward. Bolivia's Potosi region is home to over 50 percent of the world's lithium reserves. The U.S. Senate unanimously approved a bill Tuesday aimed at protecting the human rights of Hong Kong pro-democracy protesters. The Senate bill would allow the president to impose sanctions and travel restrictions on people who are found to be responsible for the arbitrary detention, torture, forced confession of any individual in Hong Kong. The Hong Kong Human Rights and Democracy Act will now go to the House of Representatives. Beijing quickly denounced the bill, and Hong Kong officials said it would harm relations between the two countries. The U.S. Senate also unanimously passed a second bill that would ban the export of tear gas, pepper spray and rubber bullets to Hong Kong's police force. Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell has urged President Trump to voice support for Hong Kong's protesters. Trump had previously promised Chinese President Xi Jinping the United States would remain quiet about the protests as the two countries pursued trade talks over the summer. The United Nations Human Rights Agency has reaffirmed the United Nations still considers the Israeli settlements in the occupied West Bank illegal under international law, despite U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo's announcement Monday that the United States no longer considers them illegal under international law. This is United Nations' Rupert Colville. On the situation uh, regarding uh, Israel and the settlements um, in the occupied territories, as part of the UN Secretariat, we continue to follow the long-standing position of the United Nations that the Israeli settlements are in breach of international law. A change in the policy position of one state does not modify existing international law, nor its interpretation by the International Court of Justice and the Security Council. To see our interview with Palestinian human rights attorney Noura Arakat on the U.S. announcement, go to democracynow.org. The Pentagon's Defense Intelligence Agency says ISIS is rebuilding itself in northern Syria following Trump's abrupt decision to move U.S. troops from key areas, clearing the way for the Turkish invasion against Syrian Kurdish fighters. The new report by the Pentagon's inspector general says ISIS has used the turmoil in the area to rebuild itself and increase its ability to launch attacks abroad. The New York Times reports the Navy SEALs are expected to oust accused war criminal Eddie Gallagher from the elite commando force only days after President Trump cleared Gallagher of any judicial punishment and restored his rank. Gallagher has been accused of shooting two Iraqi civilians and fatally stabbing a captive teenager in the neck. A California military jury acquitted him of premeditated and attempted murder charges in July, but he was convicted of a lesser offense for posing uh, for photos with the teenage captive's dead body. Trump also pardoned two other U.S. soldiers who've also been accused of committing war crimes, despite being advised against the pardons by his own defense secretary, Mark Esper. Time magazine's reporting Secretary of State Mike Pompeo is planning to resign and run for a U.S. Senate seat in Kansas next year. Pompeo has come under fire during the ongoing impeachment hearings against President Trump, with many criticizing him for failing to defend State Department officials and protect U.S. policies against Trump's efforts to politicize foreign affairs. Pompeo has not publicly confirmed his planned resignation. In immigration news, a federal judge in California has ruled the Trump administration's asylum restrictions do not apply to the tens of thousands of people who are currently in limbo at the U.S.-Mexico border. In July, the Trump administration imposed a new rule aimed at prohibiting migrants from applying for asylum if they cross through a third country before arriving at the United States. The policy aimed to sharply limit the number of Central Americans, Africans and people from other regions who are eligible for asylum. But on Tuesday, Judge Cynthia Bashant of the Southern District of California ruled asylum seekers who arrived at the U.S.-Mexico border prior to the July rule are not subject to it and can still apply for asylum in the U.S. 
Meanwhile, asylum seekers currently arriving at the U.S. border can now be sent to Guatemala after the new asylum pact between the U.S. and Guatemala took effect Tuesday. Human rights advocates say the Trump administration's new plan is particularly dangerous for female and LGBTQ asylum seekers. Guatemala has one of the highest rates of femicide, the murder of women, in the world. BuzzFeed reports Homeland Security officials are still trying to work out basic te details of the new plan to send asylum seekers to Guatemala. One Homeland Security Department brief states, quote, there's uncertainty as to who will provide orientation services for migrants, as well as who will provide shelter, food, transportation and other care, unquote. In Sweden, prosecutors have dropped the investigation into sexual assault allegations against WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange, which Assange has always denied. Assange took refuge inside the Ecuadorian embassy in London for over seven years to avoid extradition to Sweden on the charges. British authorities dragged him out of the Ecuadorian embassy in April. He's since been jailed in London's Belmarsh prison on charges related to skipping of bail in 2012, when he first entered the embassy, which he did in order to avoid extradition to Sweden over the now-dropped sexual assault charges. The United States is now seeking Assange's extradition to the U.S., where he faces up to 175 years in prison on hacking charges and 17 counts of violating the World War I-era Espionage Act. The Extinction Rebellion hunger strikes come after a separate climate action in New York Saturday, in which 29 people were arrested, protesting the construction of a frack gas power plant in Dover. Both Connecticut and New York residents oppose the power plant's construction, saying it'll pollute the air with harmful chemicals and greenhouse gases, a major driver of climate change. And the British Labour Party says it will remove companies failing to take action to climate change from the London Stock Exchange if Labour wins the general election on December 12th. The announcement came after Britain's Green Party criticized Labour for dropping plans to achieve net zero carbon emissions by 2030. In New York, authorities have brought criminal charges against two prison guards who were on duty the night serial sexual predator Jeffrey Epstein reportedly hung himself in a Manhattan jail. The indictments against them say the two guards were sleeping, shopping online for furniture and catching up on sports news instead of checking on Epstein and other prisoners every 30 minutes, and that they then falsified prison records to claim they'd perform their required rounds. The guards have been charged with conspiracy to to defraud the United States and with making false records. New York has sued the e-cigarette giant Juul, accusing the company of engaging in deceptive marketing and sales tactics aimed at targeting young people. This is New York Attorney General Letitia James. And there is no doubt that Juul, the largest e-cigarette company, has caused this addiction. In fact, they hold 70 percent of the market. And that's why today we are taking action by announcing a comprehensive lawsuit against Juul Labs, Incorporated, Juul basically took a page from Big Tobacco's playbook by marketing its products in a manner that was appealing to underage youth. The lawsuit in New York comes after President Trump abruptly reversed course and decided not to sign a memo that would have banned most flavored e-cigarettes, despite promising to do so only months earlier. Trump was reportedly concerned banning these vaping products could hurt his re-election prospects. And today marks Transgender Day of Remembrance, a day that honors the thousands of transgender and gender nonconforming people who have been killed around the world. At least 22 transgender and gender nonconforming people have died in the United States States so far this year, most of them black transgender women. Over 3,000 trans and gender nonconforming people have been killed around the world since 2008. We'll have more on the Transgender Day of Remembrance later in the broadcast. And those are some of the headlines. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. And I'm Juan Gonzalez. Welcome to all of our listeners and viewers across the country and around the world. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. Those were the words of Army Lieutenant Colonel Alex Vindman during Tuesday's House impeachment hearing, describing his reaction to a July telephone call between President Trump and Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky. During the call, 
Trump pressured Zelensky to investigate Democratic presidential candidate Joe Biden and his son Hunter, who served on the board of a Ukrainian natural gas company, Burisma, at the time that his father was vice president. Vindman, who is the director for European affairs at the National Security Council, testified in the first of two hearings on Tuesday, along with Jennifer Williams, a Russia advisor for Vice President Mike Pence. Here they are being questioned by Democratic Congressman Sean Maloney of New York. You heard the call with your own ears, right? Yes, sir. Not secondhand, not hearsay. You heard the president speak. You heard his voice on the call. Correct. And your conclusion was what he said about investigating the Bidens was your words, unusual and inappropriate, I believe. Am I, am I right? That was my testimony. And Mr. Vindman, you were treated to a July 10th meeting in the White House where you heard Ambassador Sondland raise investigations, conditioning a White House meeting on that, investigations that you thought were unduly political. I believe that's how you described them. And you went to NSC counsel and you reported it, right? Correct. And then later, you two were on the White House call, am I right? You heard it with your own ears. Correct. Not secondhand, not from somebody else, not hearsay, right? Correct. You heard the president's voice on the call. I did. And you heard him raise that subject again that Ambassador Sondland had raised before about investigating the Bidens, right? I did. And I want to ask you, when you heard him say that, what was the first thought that went through your mind? Frankly, I couldn't believe uh, what I was hearing. Um, it was probably an element of shock that uh, maybe in certain regards my worst fear of how our Ukraine policy could play out uh, was playing out and how this was likely to have uh, significant implications for U.S. national security. Army Lieutenant Colonel Alex Venman responding to a question from Democratic Congressman Sean Maloney of New York earlier during the impeachment hearing, Venman detailed why he was so concerned with Trump's actions. I was concerned by the call. What I heard was inappropriate, and I reported my concerns to Mr. Eisenberg. It is improper for the President of the United States to demand a foreign government investigate a U.S. citizen and a political opponent. I was also clear that if Ukraine pursued an investigation, it was, it was also clear that if Ukraine pursued an investigation into the 2016 elections, the Bidens and Burisma, it would be interpreted as a partisan play. This would undoubtedly result in Ukraine losing bipartisan support, undermining U.S. national security, and advancing Russia's strategic objectives in the region. The second hearing on Tuesday featured testimony from Kurt Volker, the former U.S. Special Envoy to Ukraine, and Tim, and Tim Morrison, former senior director for European and Russian affairs at the National Security Council. Both witnesses were requested to testify by Republicans, but Volker debunked conspiracy theories about Ukraine pushed by Trump's personal lawyer, Rudy Giuliani, and defended Joe Biden's honor. Volker also revised part of his, his private testimony and admitted he should have reported Trump's actions. In hindsight, I now understand that others saw the idea of investigating possible corruption involving the Ukrainian company Burisma as equivalent to investigating former President, Vice President Biden. I saw them as very different, the former being appropriate and unremarkable, the latter being unacceptable. In retrospect, I should have seen that connection differently, and had I done so, I would have raised my own objections. During Tuesday's hearing, Republican lawmakers repeatedly criticized the impeachment process. Devin Nunez, the ranking member on the House Intelligence Committee, accused Democrats of attempting to overthrow President Trump. Welcome back to Act Two of today's circus, ladies and gentlemen. We are here to continue what the Democrats tell us is a serious, somber, and even prayerful process of attempting to overthrow a duly elected president. If they're successful, the end result would be to disenfranchise tens of millions of Americans who thought the president is chosen by the American people. But Democrats defended the impeachment process. Here's how House Intelligence Committee Chair Adam Schiff closed Tuesday's marathon hearing. Indeed, I think when the Founding Fathers provided a remedy, that remedy being impeachment, they had the very concern that a president of the United States may betray the national security interests of the country for personal interests. They put that remedy in the Constitution, not because they wanted to willy-nilly uh, overturn elections, no, because they wanted a powerful anti-corruption mechanism when that corruption came from the highest office in the land. We are adjourned. 
House Intelligence Chair Adam Schiff speaking Tuesday. Today, U.S. Ambassador to the European Union Gordon Sondland will testify, the wealthy hotel magnate real estate developer in Oregon. He received his ambassadorship after donating a million dollars to Trump's inauguration. When we come back, we'll speak to Andy Kroll, Washington, D.C. bureau chief for Rolling Stone. Stay with us. I never stop seeing hallucinations. I never stop hearing your voice. I never stop needing a new brain. I never stop being profane. I never stop watching old movies. I never stop feeling sequestered. I never stop hearing the phone. your face I never stop thinking of us it never stops being absurd 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 by Kramer. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. Our guest in Washington, D.C., is the D.C. bureau chief for Rolling Stone, Andy Kroll. He's been closely covering the Trump impeachment hearings. So, Andy, we just played a series of clips. The hearing was, uh, what, around 10 hours long, with various breaks, ending about 8.30 Eastern last night. Uh, what most stood out for you? What stood out across these two marathon hearings to me was how unequivocal these four witnesses were. They were ambassadors, they were career staff, they were nonpartisan, they were picked by Democrats and Republicans for these hearings. How much an agreement they were that President Trump's request, his pressure on the Ukrainian president to investigate as Lieutenant Colonel Vindman put it, a private U.S. citizen and a domestic political arrival, how beyond the pale that was. They used words like improper, inappropriate, unusual, and wrong to describe this request by the president and then obviously the campaign that followed that request and surrounded that request, really, to get the Ukrainians to investigate Joe and Hunter Biden and to also investigate a conspiracy theory, since debunked, about the 2016 presidential election. There is no disagreement, there is no dispute among these witnesses coming from various different backgrounds, uh, political backgrounds, government backgrounds, experience, that what President did was wrong, what President Trump did was wrong, uh, and that they felt like they had to tell someone about this and even speak up in public with this impeachment inquiry about uh, what happened on that call and what President Trump did. And what about the Republican responses uh, to uh, some of the testimony, especially in Vindman, the attempts to go after him personally, questioning, uh, even uh, uh, suggesting questions about his loyalty as well? I've watched every minute of the public impeachment uh, hearing so far. I've read every page of the transcript. Trust me, that took a long time. The Republican responses to what these witnesses have said have done everything but actually question facts and try to get at the truth of what happened. And so what we saw yesterday was a pretty good encapsulation of that. You have Devin Nunes, the top Republican on the Intelligence Committee, attacking the media, attacking Democrats, attacking the witnesses. You have other members on the committee questioning, as you just noted, the loyalty and patriotism of someone like Lieutenant Colonel Vindman. Lieutenant Colonel Vindman was born in what is now Ukraine. He came to the United States as a toddler with his twin brother and his family. He went on to serve in the Iraq War, uh, earn a Purple Heart, continue to serve after uh, suffering his injury uh, for almost a year in Iraq, and has since been a public servant who has sworn an oath to the Constitution on several occasions, questioning his loyalty because a, an official with the Ukrainian government, we now know jokingly, offered Vindman uh, a position in the Ukrainian 
cabinet. And, and, and this was brought up Well, he said curiously. to become defense secretary of Ukraine, he said each time uh, he was offered that, whether or not it was a joke, he told his superior. He did. And not only did he t turn it down, obviously, he reported this to his superior. Lieutenant Colonel Vindman said yesterday he is an American. He never entertained this notion once. He found it comical. And frankly, this line of questioning, which was also echoed, I would say, by the White House on Twitter, uh, was really a way to get at the challenge, the patriotism of, again, someone who served in the Iraq War, Purple Heart, government, career, public servant, sworn an oath to the Constitution. I wanted to ask you about the, the Burisma and Hunter Biden issue, because it seems to me that, that this is going to be lasting damage to the candidacy of Joe Biden, because regardless of what the facts are, the reality is now that the Republican Party has latched on to this, uh, this attempt to—, to uh, to paint uh, Joe Biden uh, through his son as part of the, the swamp of Washington. I'm wondering your sense, since you've been covering this uh, very closely, what the potential long-term damage is to Biden on this. Yeah, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll take this—I'll put, I'll put my answer in sort of two categories here. The first one is, yes, what you've just described is true. What we see in these hearings and what we've also seen from President Trump himself, his son, his surrogates is an attempt to tarnish uh, former Vice President Biden as a presidential candidate by saying that he was involved in some kind of corrupt deal when he was vice president with Ukraine because his son, Hunter Biden, took a board position with this energy company, Burisma Holdings, a scandal-plagued company that brought Hunter Biden on clearly to help burnish its image because Hunter Biden just happened to have the last name Biden. That is happening right now, that uh, campaign against Joe Biden. It really is the origin of this whole impeachment inquiry, which was the president's personal lawyer, Rudy Giuliani, two associates of Giuliani's who have since been indicted for campaign finance uh, violations, trying to whip up a controversy around Joe Biden and Hunter Biden in Ukraine. Now, the second part that I'll say quickly is that Hunter Biden did not have any particularly sterling qualifications to be on the board of a scandal-plagued Ukrainian natural gas company. You don't bring on Hunter Biden because he is an expert in the industry for $50,000 a month. You bring on Hunter Biden because his last name is Biden. There is an appearance of a conflict of interest there. Deputy Assistant Secretary of State George Kent raised that issue uh, several years ago as he testified that he thought it had the appearance of conflict. And so that is something that is worth looking at as well. It's something we've looked at in our reporting, something other journalists have looked at as well. So I want to make sure that that's clear, too. I guess the question is, would Republicans keep on raising this during the presidential campaign? Because it also will remind you of President Trump and his involvement in this. Um, I wanted to go to Ukraine special envoy Kurt Volker, who was a witness uh, requested by the Republicans. Third, I did not understand that others believed that any investigation of the Ukrainian company Burisma, which had a history of accusations of corruption, was tantamount to investigating Vice President Biden. I drew a sharp distinction between the two. At the one in-person meeting I had with Mayor Giuliani on July 19th, Mayor Giuliani raised and I rejected the conspiracy theory that Vice President Biden would have been influenced in his duties as Vice President by money paid to his son. As I previously testified, I have known Vice President Biden for 24 years. He is an honorable man, and I hold him in the highest regard. So there's Ambassador Volker actually defending Vice President Biden. But Andy Kroll, talk about the significance of the change testimony of Volker. And then we're going to talk about what's happening today, the significance of Sondland and his change testimony and the damage he could do. So Volker's testimony was significant on the level that you just described, specifically uh, the special envoy Volker saying, as someone who had spent years in Ukraine on the front lines of these issues, he saw no connection between the work that Vice President Joe Biden did in Ukraine and what the President Trump, Rudy Giuliani, and others were trying to push this narrative that because Hunter Biden was on the board of this energy company, that Vice President Biden had been corrupted or influenced or had taken actions to benefit the company Hunter Biden was working for. We don't have evidence of that. That is why Ambassador Volker referred to that as a conspiracy theory. 
Again, Hunter Biden's position on this board is something worth looking into more. There are things we still need to learn there. But the line that the president and his allies are trying to draw in such an obvious way is not there right now. Now, today, we have Ambassador Sondland, the president's uh, chief diplomat to the EU, testifying. This will probably be the most consequential witness of this entire impeachment proceeding. Ambassador Sondland, more than anyone else, had firsthand knowledge, firsthand involvement in the effort to get the Ukrainians to make a statement saying they would investigate the Bidens and that they would investigate, again, this debunked conspiracy theory involving the 2016 election. Sondland was on calls with the president. Sondland conveyed messages to the Ukrainian president and Ukrainian senior officials. He has more firsthand knowledge of anyone, uh, of this uh, whole episode more than anyone else apart from the president himself. And, of course, his uh, direct uh, communications with uh, President Trump uh, put him in the position of being effectively the potential John Dean of this, uh, of this particular impeachment hearing, and that he could directly uh, pin the president, uh, if, he if he so uh, testifies, uh, to the attempt to shake down the Ukrainian government. That's right. What you're going to hear a lot about today is a phone call that Ambassador Sondland received from President Trump himself on July 26th. Now, remember, that is the day after this now infamous July 25th call between President Trump and the president of Ukraine, during which President Trump says, I need you to do me a favor, though. I need you to investigate the Bidens and investigate this conspiracy theory about 2016. A day after that, President Trump calls Ambassador Sondland on his cell phone in Ukraine, which means that it is almost certain that Russia had a way to listen in on this call, seeing as they control most of the cellular network in Ukraine. And on that call, President Trump asks Ambassador Sondland, are they going to do these investigations? Ambassador Sondland says, yes, they are. Ambassador Sondland says, they love your ass. Uh, basically saying that you, they're in your pocket. They'll do whatever you want them to do. And then they have a part of this conversation that I've found the most striking, honestly, which is President Trump is asked you know, what he cares about in Ukraine, how much he cares about Ukraine. And his response, according to someone who overheard the call that was sitting with Ambassador Sondland in Kyiv, is that he only cares about the investigations. He doesn't really care about Ukraine. He doesn't care about the conflict with Russia in the eastern part of Ukraine. He doesn't care about Ukraine's uh, attempts to stand on its own two legs as a democracy, its national security, our national security. What President Trump cares about is these investigations. He said that to Ambassador Sondland on that July 26th phone call. Expect to hear more about that today when Sondland testifies before the House. Of course, uh, trying to completely distance himself from Sondland, saying he hardly knows the guy. So you have Sondland, who's the ambassador to the European Union, and you can talk about the significance of this coming from Oregon, a hotel magnate. Not that the Republicans are so different from the Democrats in choosing their ambassadors as large contributors uh, to inauguration or their parties, but that he is the ambassador to the European Union. Ukraine isn't in the European Union. And the other one controlling all this is the private attorney for President Trump, Rudolph Giuliani, and a criminal investigation also being launched against him, Giuliani. That's right. When you think about it that way, you, you, you begin to understand why the president's national security advisor at the time, John Bolton, described this whole effort as a, quote, drug deal. And you understand why John Bolton, as we learned yesterday, told his deputy, Tim Morrison, again, one of the witnesses in this impeachment inquiry, anytime Morrison brought up something involving this supposed drug deal, Bolton's response was the same, quote, tell the lawyers. Even someone like John Bolton, as hawkish as they get, someone who leaps at the chance to uh, invade a foreign country or launch a foreign intervention, even he saw how messed up this was, how the individuals carrying out this quote-unquote <coughs> drug deal were far over their head and really had no clue what they were doing. As you rightly point out, Ambassador Sondland is known mostly for operating and running hotels and giving a million dollars to Trump's inauguration, a bipartisan tradition in this country. But usually, 
those um, donors to the president, those uh, wealthy hoteliers and financiers, don't find themselves actually carrying out foreign policy in a country that is critical to our national security and a hotspot in the world. Of course, we're going to continue to follow all of this. Uh, Andy Kroll, thank you so much for being with us. Washington, D.C. Bureau Chief for Rolling Stone, closely covering the Trump impeachment hearings. And by the way, Democracy Now! is broadcasting them live all day online, live streaming them at democracynow.org. When we come back, we look at Iran, where Amnesty International says security forces killed over 100 protesters. Stay with us. Civil War by Peppermint. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. We turn now to Iran, where Amnesty International says security forces have killed at least 100 protesters during nationwide demonstrations sparked by a sudden hike in fuel prices last week. On Thursday, Iran announced a rise in the cost of gas, ranging from 50 percent to 300 percent. Iranian state media says an additional 1,000 people have been arrested amid the protests. The Amnesty report also warns that death count may be much higher, with some suggesting as many as 200 have been killed. On Sunday, soon after the protests broke out, Iran imposed an almost complete Internet blackout, making it nearly impossible for protesters to use social media to share images or information about the bloody crackdown. The civil society group NetBlocks, which monitors Internet access worldwide, said Iran's usage had decreased to 4 percent of its normal level. For more, we go directly to Washington, D.C., to speak with the Iranian-American journalist Nagar Murtazavi. She's the diplomatic correspondent for The Independent. Her most recent piece headlined, As U.S. Weighs In on Iran Protests, Critics Highlight American Culpability for Economic Crisis. Welcome to Democracy Now! It's great to have you with us, Nagar. Can you explain how these protests broke out and also how you're learning about what's happening with an almost complete Internet shutdown? Good morning. Thanks for having me. So, as you said, the sudden um, increase in gas prices on Thursday night basically ignited the protests on Friday. Um, we have to remember that uh, fuel prices are heavily subsidized, have been heavily subsidized in Iran, and still, with the almost uh, 300 percent uh, increase, it's much lower, relatively lower, compared to world prices. And this has been an economic problem for the government, the high amount of money that they've been spending on subsidies. And the government has been struggling to somehow manage this. But it seems like uh, they basically rolled it out or mismanaged it in the worst way possible and ignited these uh, nationwide protests in almost 100 cities across the country. The protests got uh, pretty violent soon. And the crackdown, from the very few images that are coming out that we see, there's a very brutal crackdown happening from security forces. There are videos of security forces directly shooting at protesters, severely beating protesters, and just pushing back. And um, the government is also complaining that dozens of banks and properties, gas stations have been vandalized, set on on fire, and um, that there are leaders and coordinators that are being basically inspired, and this is ignited uh, by the enemies from the outside. But basically, 
what this comes down to is a, a, a grievance, an ongoing grievance, and not just economic grievance, but also a political grievance that Iranians have had. These protests are not new. We saw very similar protests, widespread protests, at the end of 2017, beginning of 2018, also in uh, dozens of cities across the country. And this is just, in a way, the continuation of that. And it is combined with the fact that there is high levels of corruption in different factions of the Iranian political system and a lot of mismanagement of the resources. It's a uh, basically a rich country when it comes to gas, oil and gas and natural resources, and people just don't feel like um, that is trickle trickling down to the economy, to the ordinary and average person. And then combine that also with crippling economic sanctions from the United States, and it just creates an economic crisis that is hurting average Iranians, especially working and middle classes, uh, the most vulnerable uh, segments of the society, and especially when they see that high corruption within government officials and feel like the uh, ordinary people are the ones who are taking the pressure of sanctions, of the mismanagement, of this corruption, that just adds to the anger and makes this, basically turns this into a political um, fight and not just economic. And what's been the impact of this uh, internet shutdown on the ability of the, the, of people to communicate and to organize their protests? We're seeing increasingly governments resort to this. We saw India do it in the Kash in Kashmir. Uh, uh, Egypt has tried it against uh, its protesters. Uh, what's the what's the impact from what you can tell? Well, it's extraordinary. I mean, people still organize, people still gather on the street. Let's not forget, in 1979, Iranians <laughs> launched a revolution without any internet or anything back then. So it's not difficult for people to organize, to, you know, just tell each other where to meet at what time and things. And also remember that phone lines are still open, so people can communicate over the phone. So as far as organizing, I don't think it's had a tremendous effect, although it's easier to organize over social media, and that's what the young people had been using over recent years. So that's definitely one of the reasons the internet is shut down. But the other reason, or maybe the more important reason, is for the images and the videos and the photos to not get out or not be published on social media, because that's how um, foreign-based media, basically, and reporters are going to see exactly what's happening on the ground, the brutality, the severe of the violence. And some images have made their way out. They're pretty brutal, as I said, but um, we are not really getting a full picture, at least a visual picture, of what's happening on the ground because of this almost total Internet shutdown. Mm -hmm. And talk about uh, the places in Iran where the protest is most intense and why it's happening there, uh, even more so than in Tehran. Well, Tehran, I speak to um, multiple people in Tehran. In, the, in um, many neighborhoods in Tehran, it's fairly calm, and also there's a very heavy security atmosphere, major um, cities, other cities like Mashhad, I've heard the same thing, that most neighborhoods are quiet but very securitized. It seems like the unrest is more in the suburbs, in the uh, lower-income suburbs of Tehran, in the southern Tehran. In some other major cities like Shiraz, Shiraz had seen a lot of unrest and also uh, casualties. The number of uh, people killed and injured in Shiraz and arrested also seems to be high. And, and then smaller cities and towns across the country, also two provinces, I have to mention, in the uh, south and southwest, the province of Khuzestan and the province of Kurdistan, both border areas, both have a high number of religious minorities, ethnic minorities that have long been um, you know, subject of discrimination and also economic disadvantage uh, when it comes to the central government. So there's a lot of different layers of grievances in these areas. And also Khuzestan, the, one of the two provinces where it's the center of the unrest and the repression, Khuzestan is actually the province where all the oil sits. So it's an oil-rich province. It's basically where the country gets all of its resource or uh, main source of income from. But ironically, the uh, population that lives in that province doesn't see uh, much of the economic benefit of what, basically, the, the natural resource they're sitting on. So it adds to the anger and to the grievance, combined with that ethnic and religious and um, this, basically, minority discrimination that I've been facing for years. Immediately, we see Trump weighing in, supporting the protesters. If you could talk about the significance of that, of course, you compare it to what's happening in Hong Kong, whatever deal he made with the Chinese leader not to criticize 
criticized Chinese response to uh, the Hong Kong protesters. Of course, very different in Iran right now. Honestly, I don't know why President Trump hasn't tweeted about Iran. He's been usually very quick to tweet about anything happening in Iran and protests. It, in a way, I think it just shows that this has no significance to him, especially now that he has all his attention on impeachment hearing. Nothing has came from President Trump, not even a simple statement. The only uh, statement we've heard was uh, a short one from the White House press secretary. And also, of course, uh, Secretary Pompeo has weighed in uh, multiple times, and some U.S. ambassadors have also weighed in. But then at the same time, like I argued in my piece, and I've spoken to critics, um, even uh, senior aides in Congress on the Democratic side, it's just not seen as a very genuine message of support or sympathy when it comes from the Trump administration, because this administration is basically part of the reason of the economic misery, the uh, pullout from the Iran deal, basically President Trump's unilateral exit from the nuclear deal, while Iran was committed uh, to the agreement. Um, and then the reimposition of these economic sanctions on Iran are one of the reasons that uh, Iranians are suffering economically, of course, combined with their own government's mismanagement and corruption, everything that I mentioned. But um, it's just that U.S. officials have actually acknowledged and sometimes even proudly boasted about how U.S. sanctions are hurting Iran economically. So coming out and uh, basically showing this message of support and sympathy for the people around who are basically suffering economically doesn't seem very genuine. Well, uh, an unprecedented leak of secret intelligence documents from inside the Iranian government has shed new light on how Iran has taken control of much of the Iraqi government in the wake of the 2003 U.S. invasion. The leak to The Intercept includes 700 pages of intelligence documents from 2014, 2015. And one document, Iraq's current prime minister, Abdel Abdul Mahdi, is described as having a, quote, special relationship with Iran. The, the documents also reveal a number of Iraqis who once worked with the CIA and went on to work with Iranian intelligence and exposed detailed information about the CIA's activity in Iraq. I'm wondering your, your response. It's incredible. I mean, the details of the report are very incredible, but it's not news that Iran has had and has been building all this influence and networks in Iraq. A big portion of that is actually public and very out there. And it just so shows part of the uh, grand strategy or maybe the lack of U.S. government in the region following the invasion of Iraq and um, basically uh, trying for all these years to add to influence or control uh, parts of the power structure there, while Iran, right the, ne the next door neighbor right there, has been uh, basically doing the same thing even more successfully. And it's not just in Iraq. Iran's uh, network of influence, of proxies, um, is basically across the region and multiple countries across the region. And it has given Iran uh, an advantage in some ways um, when it comes to any kind of confrontation, which I think, again, goes back to the question, to the uh, issue of President Trump basically unraveling this only diplomatic channel that was open with Iran and, uh, and basically bringing us to the brink of a conflict or this uh, impasse of a situation where there's no path open for diplomacy. Iran's influence in the region has not decreased, if not increased. Um, and it seems like Iran, Iran's, as they call, malign behavior and adventures in the region have not changed. So I'm not sure what the goal is here for the for the U.S. administration and for the president, for President Trump, but it just doesn't seem like they're moving uh, towards a very positive destination. Basically. Well, we will certainly continue to follow these issues in Iran. And for people to see our interview with Murtaza Hussein, one of the authors of the report in The Intercept in this massive, unprecedented leak of Iranian documents, you can go to democracynow.org. Nagar Murtaza, we want to thank you so much for being with us, Iranian-American journalist, diplomatic correspondent for The Independent, based in Washington, D.C. Of course, we'll continue to follow developments in Iran. This is Democracy Now! I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. Well, we end today's show reflecting on Transgender Day of, Remember of Remembrance. Over 3,000 trans and gender nonconforming people have been killed around the world since 2008. This includes at least 22 so far in the United States this year, mostly black transgender women. Among those who have died in the U.S. this year was Leilene Polanco, a transgender.
transgender woman who died in Rikers Island in June after she was arrested on misdemeanor charges and then was sent to jail for months because she could not afford $500 bail. That same month, Chanel Lindsay was murdered in Dallas shortly after a video went viral showing her being attacked by a mob of men shouting homophobic and transphobic slurs. Also in June, a transgender Salvadoran woman named Johanna Medina died in ICE custody, Immigration and Customs Enforcement, where her family says she was repeatedly denied medical care. Activists say today is also a celebration of the community's resistance and are calling on people to fight for policies that would protect trans lives. For more, we stay in Washington, D.C., where we're joined by Lala Bizanel, longtime transgender rights advocate, co-producer of The Womanity Project, featured film Lala's World, an upcoming documentary series on the experiences of a black trans woman living in America. Lala Bizanel, we welcome you to Democracy Now! Talk about the origins um, of this day, of the Transgender Day of Remembrance. Okay. Um, first of all, thank you for having me. Um, I just want to do a correction. When you talked about the video that went viral, that was Malaysia Booker. And so I want to make sure that, you know, we get the name right so people can understand, you know, what happened and to honor her name. And, and, and today, tell us what happened to Malaysia. Well, Malaysia Booker, as, um, it was a video that went viral where she was brutally assaulted. You know, no one should be brutally attacked like that. No one helped her. And then after that, shortly, she is no longer with us. To further the insult, also, even when they went to trial, the defense on the other side was trying to dead name her in the trial, and the judge had threw that out to try to desynthesize um, what happened to make it seem like it was two men just fighting when we know she was a trans woman, a woman, and that causes a lot of hate violence as well. Trans Day of Remembrance is a day for trans people across the country to take a moment to celebrate the living while using that moment to honor the ones that we have lost in this movement. But also, it has become like, um, excuse my French, Christmas to some people. It is also a month where we get so many phone calls from colleges, from newspapers, from all these organizations that just want to do something and feel that having trans folks come in these spaces, saying the name, light a candle, and going home, and that makes it seem like you've done the work, when you have not showed up the rest of the 364 days of the year. And so for this year, a lot of trans folks are reclaiming this space and reclaiming this moment because we've had such a hard year with this administration. And we are focusing on intent versus impact. We're really trying to curate events that are places of healing and places that are not trauma for trans folks. Because every time a trans woman, particularly a trans woman of color, dies, um, it is like you're always in anxiety. You're always in the lived reality that you could be next. And so we want to be authentic about honoring those that are here alive and working with organizations, working with groups and working with each other to come up with tangible solutions so that next year, the goal is not to be keep on having, oh, the numbers are higher, the numbers are higher. The goal is to have more trans women of color not being killed for who they are. And if we, if we lose some along the way, that it should be for natural causes and not for you being killed for who you are. And so on this day, we challenged people to show up for us daily, not just during T-Door. And I think that there has been lots of um, events across the country that I've been watching that have been informed in doing that. And that's very, very, very important. Also, policies and laws are amazing. But we also know that that does not always end because people still can resist against those policies and laws. And so we know this administration has clearly gave a very fine clue that transgender people are the target of this regime. And so the thing that you can do as state lawmakers, local lawmakers, as organizations, as corporations, as common neighbors in your neighborhood, the best way for you to combat that is for you to show up for trans folks, 
for you to call out transphobia when it happens in your neighborhood, for you to not misgender trans people, for you to honor and protect the ones that are in your neighborhood, for you to go to your schools and tell schools that you don't mind that trans folks go there, and they need safe spaces to go to the bathroom, and they're allowed to play in sports, and they're allowed to go to the prom as their authentic selves. You show up to your job and you say, in this space, we're going to hire trans people. We're not going to allow transphobia. We're not going to discriminate against people. And when you see violence happening, you don't just pull out your phone and record, but you actually be a bystander to end the violence against trans women of color. But, Lala, and to people who are— Yes, go ahead. Lala, <laughs> you mentioned the attacks of the Trump administration. What about the role of the, yes. mass, of the mass media as well, in terms of uh, being possibly complicit mm -hmm. in the violence against trans women? trans people? Well, I think that over the years, trans is a lot of trans leaders and trans folks around the co country, like you have, you know, Monica Roberts, who does her own blog. You have trans leaders that work at Out Magazine and other places. I think that we are BuzzFeed, you name it. And I think that we're trying to take over the narrative and try to be on top of the misgendering and the dead naming that happens in the media and being on top of trying to tell media how to talk about our stories and how to reach out to the leaders in progressive areas where that happens. And media also needs to spin the narrative of that our lives are real, that our existence is real, and that our experiences are real. So I will give you an example, right? So say you're watching the, ten the you know, your morning news this morning. Unfortunately, there's a tragic thing that happens, and say a, a woman's killed. The news reporter will say, Sally, a beautiful mother of four, a beautiful—she went to church. She was beautiful in her community. She was tragically murdered. That's what—that's the narrative, right? For a trans person, it is a trans person was murdered. Then it's like they will find the name that they had, which is a dead name. They will bring up their criminal record. They will try to insinuate that they were indulging in sex work. They will try to insinuate that they were fooling someone and not being their authentic self. And that is not the narrative. If you look at the numbers, there have been lots of people who knew folks that they were attached to. There was a lot of intimate partner violence, which is the same thing as domestic violence, that happens for trans people, for folks who love them causing them harm, They're for folks who are even their family members sometimes causing harm. You know, look at the young gay guy who was killed by his own father. And so there's a resistance of queerness and a bigger resistance and fear of transness, and particularly trans women of color, who are in the intersections of race and their gender, right? And they're living in these areas that don't have that um, political education or the general education to understand what trans issues are, because they're not having access to that in school, because they don't want that in school, because it's not deemed as important. But it is important. It is just like U.S. history. It is just like racism conversations. Gender is a part of this world. It is a part of this community. It has been here for a long time, and it will continue to be here. Lala, you can't can you, erase it. Can you tell us your own story? Uh, hold on just a minute. This microphone's falling out. About what, what would you like to, to talk about? Your own story. Um, just talk about um, uh, your own um, uh, experience as a black trans woman and what you think it's most okay. important for people to understand. So for people who are just like me, who are black and brown, I need you to understand that I experienced the same racism, the same things that you are conflicting and battling within this country. I am experiencing the same thing. I just get an extra layer because of my sexuality. So I was um, blessed to be able to have a mother who loves and affirms me. I told my mother at 15 years old, at, my mother's a pastor, I'm a preacher's kid. It was very hard for her as a pastor to really understand, but one thing she never weighed from is that she loved her child, and that no matter what this transition in my life or how she didn't, she didn't let her lack of understanding stop loving me. My mother loved me through this whole process. My family loved me and supported me, and that's very, very important that your family 
love and support you through the process. Lala yes, Bizanel, I want to uh -huh. thank you so much for being with us, um, uh, especially yes. on this Transgender Day of Remembrance. Lala is a longtime transgender rights advocate uh, and, of course, will continue to cover trans issues. We urge you to tune in today. Uh, Democracy Now! is live streaming the impeachment hearings today at democracynow.org, beginning at 9 a.m. Eastern. And also, Juan, you and I will be on Friday night. Uh, in New York at the People's Forum at a conference marking the 20th anniversary of the 1999 protests against the WTO in Seattle, the Battle of Seattle. Uh, we'll both be together and uh, moderating and speaking at the forums that go for two days here in New York City. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. Thanks so much for joining us.